Welcome to Slate Church Online. We are so glad that you're tuning in today, and we pray that this message will bless you no matter where you're watching from. If this message impacts you today, we would love to hear about it. Send an email to mystory@slatechurch.com. You guys can go ahead and grab your seats, and why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, are you ready? Why don't you turn to your other neighbor and say, I'm ready. All right, we got like three people ready. We're good. Um, but seriously, I'm ready this morning, because I'll be honest with you guys, it's been a little bit of a tough week for me. Uh, it's just been a week where I faced a bit of frustration, uh, just feeling a little bit defeated in some areas of life. And, and to be completely honest with you guys, the message that I've prepared for today is really what I feel the Holy Spirit has been putting on my heart this week. I think it's the message that he's been giving to me, what he's been downloading in me. It's been working in me. He's been doing something inside of me this week. And I firmly believe that he wants to do something in you too. You know, I really believe that we need to be ready because the Holy Spirit is ready to actually pour something out to us today to help us leave this place, not the same way that we came in, but to actually leave this place changed, to leave this place with new encouragement, with new hope, with new conviction. So are you ready? All right, we're, we'll get there. I want to jump right into scripture. So if you have your Bible, whether it's on a phone or, or physical forms, I'm getting texts, uh, more texts. Uh, John chapter 4, probably should have put this on silent. Uh, John chapter 4 is where we're going to be reading out of today. But before I get there, I actually want to introduce myself. As Pastor Luke said, my name's Nate, and my wife Emily and I, we lead our family ministries here at Slate Church. And it's such an honor and a privilege to be able to pour into and invest in the next generation. You know, we really believe here that we're building a church that we don't want to end with us. We're not building a church that's just for today or for this generation or for the people in this room. But we want to build a church that's for generation after generation after generation after generation. And it's really a privilege that we get to be a part of that through our family ministries here. And we get to do all of this under the leadership of our incredible lead pastors, Luke and Victoria Becker and Brandon Emma Richardson. And it's so important that we as a church honor them. You know, I, I think that sometimes in our society, people get kind of weird about honor. Like, oh, like, why are you lifting that person up? Blah, blah, whatever. And I think my favorite example of honor in the Bible is when David is being pursued by Saul. And you might not know who these people are. If you don't, it's fine. Just know that David was going to be king. Saul currently was king, and Saul was trying to kill David because he knew that David was one day going to be king. And Saul's chasing David down, and a couple times David has opportunities to actually kill Saul. Saul is undefended. David's there. He could end it all. He could save his own life, save himself, but he doesn't do it because he honors the fact that Saul was king. He honors the fact that God had placed Saul in that position of leadership, and he wasn't going to disrespect God by killing and not honoring that leader, even though that leader was trying to kill him. And I can tell you, our lead pastors are not trying to kill anybody <laughs> in this room. And, and so how much more should we be honoring our lead pastors for the way that they faithfully have stepped out, for them carrying the vision that God has given them for this church, and for the way that they're actually leading us to impact this city? Come on, why don't we celebrate our lead pastors? All right, I want to jump into John chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. It says this, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees... If you don't know, the Pharisees were religious leaders of the day. Uh, they were folks who would oftentimes use their advanced learning and knowledge, the fact that they had more education than others, to actually uh, use the laws and traditions of the time to say that, hey, we know what's best and you don't know what's best. And they would actually use that education and that information to have power over the people around them. And so they had this position of privilege and authority, and they would oftentimes abuse this power and this knowledge. So Jesus learned that the Pharisees, the religious leaders who were abusing their authority, had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. 
What makes that really cool is that John is often referred to in the Bible as John the Baptist. Like baptizing people was this guy's whole deal. It's like they literally named him after it. Yet it says Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist. So the Pharisees had heard this, that he was baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist, although it was not in fact Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. And I love that because it shows us that we get to serve a God who's actually willing to empower and equip us. Do you guys get that? We're, we serve a God who's not just going to snap his fingers like Thanos and make it all happen. Uh, but we actually get to serve a God who wants to use us, who wants to use you, who has a plan and purpose for your life. And he's actually going to equip you and empower you to be a part of the plan, not just an observer of his plan for humanity. We'll get through this verse, I promise. So Jesus learned that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. He was in a place called Judea. This is where kind of where Jerusalem would be in the south. And Galilee is actually where Jesus was from. That's the place where he grew up. So he had come where he's from. He was ministering Judea, but now there was a threat on his life. There was a danger because these Pharisees and these religious leaders, these rulers of the day, wanted to kill him because their authority was threatened by the freedom that he was giving people. And actually, it's something that I think is cool, and just a little side note on this, is that you don't actually have to stay in a dangerous situation. You know, even Jesus, when he was in a dangerous situation, left to carry on his ministry and his work elsewhere. And now we know that Jesus actually went back to Judea. He went back to that gender, dangerous place and freely sacrificed himself, dying, coming back to life to save us. But at this point, he had more work to do here on earth. So he left that dangerous situation. And I want to encourage you that if you're in a dangerous or abusive relationship, you don't need to change that person. That's probably not your job. And yes, God wants their heart too. God wants to take a hold of them too. But you're probably not going to be the one who's in the position to do that. And it's okay to leave a dangerous situation so that you can get healthy, so that you can get set free, and you can come back with strength. So Jesus, he's leaving Judea, and he's going back to Galilee. And it says, now he had to go through Samaria. And Samaria is this place right in between Judea and Galilee. We have Samaria. And oftentimes, the Jewish people at this time would go around Samaria rather than going through Samaria. Because they looked down on the Samaritans. These were actually people who had come from uh, the conquerors who had conquered Israel in the past, mixing with the Israelites, and these were their descendants. And, 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 the, and the Jewish people of the time looked down on them. They had these racist views towards them. They thought of them as less than. They had wanted to not be associated with them in any way possible. They were impure people, so they would oftentimes go around Samaria. So now, G, now he had to go through Samaria. And as he goes through, he comes to a town called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. He took a pit stop. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone down into town to buy food. And what follows here... Jesus, he's going from Judea to Galilee. He makes this pit stop in Samaria by a well because he's tired from the journey. And a woman comes up and he starts to interact with her. And he says, hey, can I get some water? She's kind of like, uh, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. So why are you even talking to me? That was totally unheard of at this time. And Jesus is kind of like, do you even know who you're talking to? She's kind of like, um, nope, I just wanted some water, and now you're talking to me. <laughs> and he's like, what if I could hook you up with some living water? <laughs> She's like, um, okay. She's like, uh, what, what is this living water? She's kind of like, I'm the living water. And I feel at that point she had to like shuffle back a little bit. Like she was kind of moving. She's like, okay, all right, all right, weird flex, but okay. 
And uh, Jesus is like, I'm living water. And then they start going into this conversation and so they, they start debating about uh, where people should worship and practice and which temple is the right temple, these, all these different things. They're going back and forth. And she gets to this point in the conversation. And she's like, well, the Savior, the Messiah, the one who's going to come. I know there's one coming. And when he comes, he can settle this debate for us. And then I love this moment because Jesus just like total baller move. It's just like, I am he. And reveals himself to the woman, shows himself and identifies himself as the savior who is coming to actually make that change, to save people, to settle the debates. And it's cool because then he starts to go through and actually highlight some of the woman's past. He speaks to some of the situations and pains she's been through, some of the mistakes that she's made, and she is amazed and, and trusts that he is who he says he is. And it's amazing because the woman, she drops her bucket, and she runs away, and she goes into the town, and she starts grabbing people and telling them, the Messiah is here, the Messiah is here, the Savior is here, he's come, and, they, and she brings them back to connect with Jesus. And in this moment, in the middle of this journey from Judea to Galilee, at this small pit stop by a well where Jesus sat down, not just as this whole woman's life transformed, but this whole city's life is transformed by the good news of Jesus. And I'm excited to dive into the rest of this scripture today as we really look at the transforming power and grace that comes through Christ. I want to dive into this moment, this pit stop and what happens here and really begin to understand what's going on and how we can apply it to our lives today. Are you guys all right if we pray? Awesome. Jesus, I just thank you so much for what you want to do in this room this morning. I just thank you right now that you've been working on my heart this week, that I've been processing and dealing with this message, that your Holy Spirit's actually been trying to wake me up to something and will awaken truths in me, Lord God. And I just pray right now that these words would not be mine words, but they would be your words, Lord God. And that as I speak this message, Jesus, that your Holy Spirit would just begin to work in the hearts and minds of the people here, Lord God, that there are truths and there are powerful messages in this, Lord Jesus, that you want to deliver today. I just pray that the people here would be open and ready to receive receive it, that we would just know that you have hope and encouragement for us today, Lord Jesus, and that we would be able to walk out of this place changed and confident about who you are. Pray this in your name, and everybody said, Amen. all right, who in here likes to go on a road trip? Who likes a good road trip? We got a lot of road trippers in here, all right. I love a good road trip. And I want to apologize, too, for the parents, because I'm sure a few parents heard me say the word road trip, and now just the phrase, are we there yet, is just reverberating around in your brain. I apologize for the PTSD I'm bringing up. But growing up, my family, we'd go on road trips all the time, all the time. And we've actually driven as far as PEI on the East Coast. We've gone as far as Vancouver on the West Coast. We've gone down to Florida, uh, you know, all across the U.S., visiting different national parks. I love going on road trips. It's a part of my childhood. I still love it. But I hate pit stops. I really don't like stopping while I'm on a road trip. Because here's the thing about me. Like, road trips are great. You know, hanging your arm out the window, putting on a great podcast or some music, having conversations. You know, it's beautiful seeing the country, all of that. But I think I really like road trips for the challenge. I, like, I really like road trips because they're, they're kind of like an endurance sport in some ways. <laughs> like a good road trip gives you the same satisfaction as like running a marathon. You know, if you're on a good road trip, you're just going and you're looking at Google Maps and you like take that time that they tell you it's going to take you. Like, we're going to cut that by 20% and we're going to make it there. It's about how, how fast you can go, uh, how hard you can drive, how, like, how much you can, like, how many pit stops you can avoid. What is the mental fortitude that you have? How many hours can you go straight? How many coffees does it take? It's, it's amazing. It's a challenge and I love it. And so it frustrates me to no end every time we need to make a pit stop. Every time we need to slow down, take a pre-break, a food break, a gas stop, it just like kills me inside a little bit. That's why I love Tim Hortons. I feel like people are kind of beating up on Tim Hortons a lot lately. Uh, but I love Tim Hortons because you go through that drive through you get your food, keeps you sustained, you get your coffee, help you drive through the night. And in a couple hours, you don't have to stop for a bathroom break, you already have something to go there. 
that's gross. <laughs> One drive that I always loved was when I lived in Ottawa. I was living there and Emily and I were dating and I would drive back to visit her uh, fairly often. And I was always so excited to see her. It would have been weeks at a time before I had seen her. And I would drive as fast as I possibly could from Ottawa. I'd whip down the 401 to get back and visit her. And when you're trying to do a road trip right and you're on the 401 in Ontario, you need to make sure that you only stop at the on routes. Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? You only need to stop at the on routes because the on routes, they're right on the highway. They have everything you need. They have the food, they have the bathroom, they have the gas. They're right on the highway. You're quick, you're in and out, you're back on the road. See, what you don't want to do is you don't want to pull off in like a city, especially in the GTA. You do not want to pull off in a city because as soon as you get out there, you're like pulling up. You're like, which way is the gas station? Tim Hortons is that way. Gas is that way. It's going to be a much longer trip, slowing you down. You don't want to do that. You always want to make sure you hit the on routes. And that presents a challenge for me. Because driving back from Ottawa, there's an on route in Newcastle, Ontario. And the next on route is 187 kilometers away on the other side of the GTA in Cambridge, Ontario. And this 187 kilometers always presented me a challenge. Because you never want to stop in Toronto. It's the worst place to stop. And without fail, every time, I would be in the middle of Toronto, right in like some heavy traffic, and I would like start to feel like I got to pee a little bit. <laughs> Not like I got to go, but like I could. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, you know, we're fine. We're going to be good. You know, stop and go traffic, we'll make it. And, you know, I start going and I'm going and, you know, we start to get out of the GTI, I hit Milton, Ontario. And at this point, I have to go. I definitely have to go. But see, Milton, Ontario has a sign that says 20 kilometers to the Cambridge en route. And that sign was just like a beacon of hope for me in the darkest night. I would just see that sign, and I'm like, I can make it. I can make it. And so I'm like going, I'm pushing, I'm starting to like, you know, move a little more. Put, like turn the music up a little bit, distract myself. Heading from Milton, I'm starting to really hit the gas right now. I'm flying. And for some reason, every time I would get to the Cambridge en route, my opportunity to pull off and do what I needed to do, and I would be like, well, I'm only like 20 minutes from Emily's place at this point. I think I can make it. And so I would just hit the gas. I'd floor it past the on route. And at this point, I hit the 85 coming into Waterloo. And I, I, like, you pull up beside me, I look like I'm possessed with something. I'm just like moving and dancing. My foot up's on the dash for some reason. I don't know how that helps. I was like smacking the glass, like somebody pray for me, please. And I would whip up. i pull up in front of Emily's place. And the worst part is I was driving so fast. I was trying to get there because I wanted to see her. Yeah, she would come down the stairs. She's like, babe, I love you. She'd like open up her arms to give me a hug. I'd be like, out of my way. I need to use the washroom. I don't really like pit stops. See, when I'm in one place and I want to be somewhere else, I hate being slowed down. I hate it when things get in my way. I can't stand being stopped, distracted, or held up by obstacles. I think so often in life, we find ourselves in one place and we're desperate to be somewhere else. We find ourselves looking ahead at our hopes and aspirations and we get so frustrated when barriers and obstacles pop up between us, uh, between where we are and where we want to be. We hate the things that stand between us and where we want to be. We're frustrated by the pit stops and detours of life, and we find ourselves punching the gas, blowing past the on route, putting the blinders on, so goal-focused that we miss everything that's happening around us. We get so caught up in our calendars and our schedules, and we start to ignore anything that isn't part of the plan. You know, even with something good like marriage, you know, we get focused on this goal, I need to find a spouse. And we get so focused on it that we start missing the opportunities that are all around us in this season because we feel like we can't move forward or actually progress until we've achieved that goal. And my hope with this message today is that we would lift our heads up. You know, that we would begin to take the blinders off. And that when we're here, and we have a goal over there, we could actually recognize that there's a lot of beauty between. 
There's a lot of opportunity between where we're going and where we are today. And if we get so goal focused, if we get so narrowly focused on what we can see as the target ahead of us, we're going to miss opportunities that God is placing in our lives. We're going to clap. We're going to clap. See, I think that for some of us, the obstacles we are facing in our lives are actually an opportunity from God. I think some of the things that we're calling out as distractions in our lives right now are actually a divine intervention that is meant to provide us with a course correction. Why don't you turn to your neighbor on your left? Look at them. Just turn. Look at your neighbor on your left. Really look at them. Say hi. Look around. All right, all right, now, now turn to your neighbor on your right. Turn to your neighbor on your right. Look at them. Look at them. Good. Now I want you guys to look back. I want you to say, I'm the beauty between. <laughs> See, you guys are less arrogant than the 9 a.m. The 9 a.m. just said it. They owned it. They're like, yep, I am the beauty between. You guys are like, whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on here? If you're taking notes, you can title this message, The Beauty between. And I want us to dive back into this scripture, this story of Jesus encountering the woman at the well, and look at the ways that each character in this story finds the beauty between. Jesus finds the beauty between Judea and Galilee. The woman finds the beauty between herself and the well, and the disciples find the beauty between what they understand and what's actually God's plan. Let's start with the beauty between Judea and Galilee. So to recap, Jesus is, Jesus is in Judea. The religious leaders want to kill him. He's heading over to Galilee, and he decides to make a pit stop in a place called Samaria. And what's interesting about this is that Christ's ministry on earth was to the Jews first. See, when he calls his disciples out and sends them on their work to begin with, he specifically tells them not to go to the Samaritans. He specifically tells them not to focus on Samaria first because his plan was to go to God's chosen people from the Old Testament, the Jewish people first, reveal himself to them and through them to reach out and impact Samaria and all the rest of the nations. Does that make sense? That was his plan. That was the order of things. That was the master plan that was taking place. So in Matthew 10, 5, 6, it says, These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And it's interesting because it shows us that this stop in Samaria was incidental. It wasn't about going in and preaching to the Samaritans. It actually says, so he left Judea, went one, back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Samaria was a means to an end. It was in between Judea and Galilee, the places Christ intended to be and the places that he was actually starting his ministry here on earth. But I want you to know this morning that Jesus is never in the wrong place. Even in between, he's still working. He's still transforming lives. See, this encounter was incidental. It was not accidental. I think it's an important distinction because the word incidental means on the periphery. It means something that is not part of the main goal. It's not a crit mission critical element. And this wasn't. The transformation that, had in, that happened in Saqqar in Samaria wasn't part of the master plan. It wasn't part of the bigger picture in the same way that the ministry in Judea and Galilee were at the time, but it was no accident either. It may have been incidental, but it was not accidental because even in the in-between, even when it looks like he isn't there, even in the, when it doesn't fit perfectly with all of the plans for our life, God is still working, he's still showing up, and he's still ready to make an impact. There is beauty between where we are and where we want to go. Our God is a God of the in-between. He's a God that shows up in the moments we least expect. He's a God that is actually going to interrupt our plans and our priorities and invite us to be a part of making the world around us a better place. There was a time, and I won't say when this was or, or where I was for privacy reasons, but there was a time I was working at a job and I had a big opportunity come up, a really big chance to prove myself, 
to show myself, to, to advance myself, an opportunity that would have hopefully led to other opportunities. And, and I was invested in this a lot. And honestly, I, I really believed that, you know, if I could just pull this off, I could have even more influence in my workplace. You know, that would be great. I could impact more people. This is so important. I was so invested in crushing this opportunity. And it was a, a, just under an hour before this, this thing was supposed to take place. And one of my colleagues messaged me and said, hey, like, could you talk for a minute? And I remember I was kind of like, all right. Um, I was like, hey, like, uh, you know, is there something you really want to talk about now? Or could we talk this afternoon? My colleague was like, oh, man, I'd really love to talk right now. It's like, all right. Cool. Cool, cool. I'm not stressed or anything. This is fine. This is a great moment for me. And I also was a little bitter. I was a little frustrated that that this was inconveniencing me, inconveniencing me as I was preparing for this opportunity. But my colleague came to me and they started to open up. They started to tell me about the mental health issues they were going through, and the fact that they hadn't been able to tell anybody else about it. And I was able to share my own journey with mental health and how Jesus helped me through that with my colleague in this moment. And, and I felt like God just so clearly said to me, this is why you're here. You're not here for a promotion. You're here for the people. And I realized in that moment that if my plan doesn't prioritize the people around me, it's not a plan from God. If the core motivation for the actions I'm taking isn't actually seeing and being there for the people who are on my left and on my right, then it's probably not a very good plan. And don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with being successful at work. There's nothing wrong with going in and doing your best. I really believe that the Bible calls us to go into every place in our life and do our best for the glory of God. You know, there's nothing wrong with having a lot of things on our calendars, with investing in our kids' sports teams, with investing in our work, with investing in our relationships, with investing in our family. There's nothing wrong with these things. They're all good things. But if we focused on them so much, have we put on such blinders that we're missing the opportunities that are around us? Have we started to focus so much on what's next on our calendar that we can't see the opportunities in between that God is placing there for us? Are we so focused on our careers that we can't see the opportunities we have to impact our colleagues? Are we so focused on our kids' sports teams that we're not seeing the opportunities we have to impact the coaches and the other parents? Are we so focused on just building into our families that we're not actually taking time to share the good news of Jesus with our families because we're afraid it's going to make something awkward? And to be honest, I had it easy. My friend came up and talked to me. That was an easy interruption to welcome. See, Jesus didn't just welcome the interruption when he saw the woman. He actually invited the interruption. You know, the woman didn't come up to him and say, hey, Jesus, can we talk? Jesus went to the woman and asked her for water. See, what's happening here is Jesus had the vision he had the sight to see the pain and the purpose in that woman's life. And he was able to reach out to her and make an impact and take that opportunity. And I wonder what would happen if all of us in this room started to see the people around us like Jesus sees them. What if we start to recognize the pain and the struggles that the people who were side by side with day in and day out are going through? What if we start to see the potential and the purpose and the impact that these people could make? What if we started to recognize that God has a plan for each and every one of his children? He has more for their lives, and he's giving us opportunities to call that more out of these people, call them into a greater life, a more abundant life with him. What if we had the vision to see the beauty between? He saw her pain and her potential he approached her. But Jesus didn't just welcome the interruption. He didn't just invite the interruption. Jesus actually carried the interruption to completion. See, it says that Jesus not only had this conversation at the well with the woman, but he actually stayed in the town for two days teaching the people there of who he was of taking the time to invest in them and pour in them and be there for them. And honestly, I think this is often the hardest part. When somebody comes up to you and needs help, it's pretty easy to say, sure, I'll help. 
Oftentimes, if someone's looking down or sad, it's actually not that hard to welcome that quick interruption and chat with them in the moment. It's not. But I think it's a lot harder for us to carry it out, for us to th- see that work through to completion. You know, once somebody's opened up to us, are we following up with them? Are we texting them? Are we checking in? Are we walking alongside people, pastoring them, caring for them, being there not just in one moment or for one day, but being there for the highs and lows of life? I want to talk about Josh's legacy for a second. Come on, this guy's beautiful. Uh, Again, if you're looking for other single people in this church, Josh is also single. Judging by his Instagram profile pic, he's ready to mingle. So... Get wrecked. Um, But Josh is fantastic. And if you know Josh, you know that he is in everybody's wedding. It's ridiculous. I think he actually had two weddings that he was asked to be in the party for this year that were on the same day and he had to choose. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And like, not only is he in people's wedding, but more often than not, he's the best man in people's wedding. Like, you would not believe the amount of people who have said, yes, I have a best friend, the person I am closest with in life is Josh Legacy. It's like, how are there like 35 people who you are their closest friend? It's insane. I think the best example of it uh, is Tom and Mariana, friends of mine, and uh, they had a super private wedding. It was really small, and uh, they were telling me about it one time. Like, yeah, you know, it's just us and our immediate family, no aunts, no uncles, no other relatives, just our immediate family, super small. There was like five people. I was like, wait a second, there's only like four people in your family. And they're like, oh, yeah, Josh Legacy was there as well. (laughs) The craziest part, at this point, I was seeing Tom and Mariana once a week, And Josh was a leader in our family ministries who I saw at least once a week. And I didn't even know that they knew each other, let alone the fact that Josh was the only person outside of their immediate family who attended their wedding ceremony. It's incredible. So I went to Josh. I was like, Josh, teach me. How do you do it? How are so many people, like, looking up to you in this way? How are you making such an impact on so many people's lives that they just want you there at their most special moment of their life? And I love it because he just looked at me and he just goes, I make the time. Come on. I make the time. He's like, yeah, sometimes I have more important things to do. Sometimes I have other stuff going on. Uh, You know, sometimes I have other commitments, but if somebody needs me, I'll drop it and I'll make the time. It's so simple, but it's such a hard lesson for us to learn. And I just can't imagine what would happen in our city if more of us started making the time for the people around us instead of getting so caught up in our own priorities and our own little worlds. Let's be the kind of people who welcome the interruption, who invite the interruptions, and who see the interruptions through to completion. Now I want to talk about the beauty between the woman and the well. This woman approaches the well and is interrupted. See, she's on her way to get water, and she's stopped by a strange man who's standing between her and the thing she needs to survive. I think some of us in this room might feel a little hopeless. You know, maybe your life recently has felt kind of like this woman's may have, living just to survive. You know, it, we read later in the passage that she was struggling with relationships, having five husbands uh, in, in a short period of time. We see that, you know, her finances probably weren't that great if she was going to get this water herself. And I think for some of us, it feels like our life is going from defeat to defeat to defeat to defeat. And that's the in-between that we're caught in caught in between failure after failure. We feel hopeless. And we start searching for wells and waters that will satisfy our desires. You know, we know that something's missing. There's a longing in our hearts. And so we start looking for the wells and waters that are gonna satisfy us. You know, maybe we start looking in this relationship or this friendship, or if I could just get this leader's approval, maybe I'll feel good about myself. 
You know, we start looking at things online that we shouldn't be looking at, thinking that maybe that's going to satisfy us. We start looking at the bottom of a bottle, thinking that there might be something down there that's going to quench the thirst that we're experiencing. We're like this woman going back to the well over and over and over and over again, but never being fully satisfied. But this day, she was interrupted. There was a barrier between her and the well. I think some of us, we keep going back to these same wells and we're seeing obstacles between us and what we think we need. We're seeing barriers between us and it's like, well, I just need to get that water. So if you could get out of my way, that'd be great. And I want to challenge you this morning that maybe the barrier between you and the well that you've been going to for a long time is actually an opportunity for redirection. Maybe the, what looks to you to be a barrier is actually an opportunity for God to make a shift and a change in your life because there is something greater than that well. There is something greater than the thing you keep going back to. There is a living water. There is a hope in Jesus. There is a salvation through Christ. Maybe the pit stop is a push in the right direction and a chance to experience life in the fullest. I want to talk about the beauty between the disciples' understanding and the truth. There's a gap. The disciples think one thing. They think this way. And this makes sense to them. And then there's what God's actually doing over here. There's this in-between space, and I love this part of the scripture a little later on after, well, Jesus is finishing up talking to the woman at the well, and the disciples come over, and he uses the beauty between this gap to actually teach them and educate them on God's plans for them and for us. And it's an incredible opportunity for us to learn from his teaching. And I really believe that the disciples here represent the Christians in the room. They represent us who believe in Jesus. And maybe we have for a while, but we just don't get it. You know, we look around and we totally miss the mark. See, the disciples see the world one way and totally miss the reality of the mission God has called them to. In John 4, 27 to 38, it says, Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, What do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Good call, boys. If this doesn't represent Christians, I don't really know what does. How often do we look around at the person who had a divorce and is now serving in church and we're like, why is she here? We look at the people who come through the doors in the lobby and you're like, oh, you know what? I'm glad they're here, but I'm just going to talk to somebody else because, yeah. How often do we look around and we make judgments about the life and the places and the stages of other people? We question their qualifications. We question what God is doing in other people's lives. We get so caught up debating the little nitty gritty points of faith. And just like the disciples, we often don't even have the guts to say anything about it. It says this, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. I love that while the disciples are standing around, wondering why Jesus is talking to a woman, oh no, as the disciples are obsessing over the little rules and traditions, pondering pondering whether or not it's even appropriate for this conversation to happen, the woman drops her bucket by the well and runs out to the people and starts doing the disciples' job for them. Come on, while the disciples are sitting around debating whether the worship is too loud or too quiet, while they're debating whether we should have a fog machine in church or not, while they're sitting and standing around debating whether they should keep that person in their connect group because they just don't really like their vibe, while they're sitting around and debating all the little nitty-gritty pieces of theology and things that they think are so important, the woman at the well is running out and she is making disciples. She is reaching people. She is sharing the good news. She's bringing them back home to Jesus. 
Come on, church. Are we going to stand around and debate the annoying details and let the people who got baptized in our services last week go out and reach people for us? Because trust me, the people who got baptized last week, I know that those people are in their workplaces this week sharing the good news of what happened. I know that those people are in their families sharing the good news of what happened. I know those people are showing up in their spheres of influence and saying, look at what my God has done for me. So are we going to sit here and debate the details? Are we going to shift our perspective? And I love this. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him. While the woman's out there sharing the good news, the disciples urge Jesus. They say, Rabbi, eat something. Teacher, eat something. Jesus says to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. His disciples said to each other, <laughs> they're so clueless. They're like, could uh, somebody else have gotten him food? <laughs> you just don't get it. My food, Jesus says, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Come on, the work wasn't done yet. He had had the first conversation, but he hadn't yet seen it through to completion. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. In other words, the disciples' religion is, is blinding them from the reality of the situation. They're so caught up in the minor details, in the religious landmines that were likely laid for them throughout their whole upbringing that they don't see that now is the time. Is anybody in here a farmer? Any farmers? Okay, we got like a half farmer. That's good. I know Pastor Ben's back there. He grew up on a farm. You wouldn't tell it by the way he dresses, but he did. A man can milk a cow. I'm not a farmer. Uh, I know very, very little about farming. So if I get anything wrong in this part, just have some grace. But we were going to have an Easter dinner the other week, and uh, Emily's family was all getting together. And I know that her aunt and uncle, who were going to come, weren't able to make it last minute. And the only reason we got was that the tomatoes had to be sprayed or something. I have no clue what that means. I have no clue what they were doing, those tomatoes. I have no clue what stage of growth those, were toma those tomatoes were in. I just knew that it was the time for the tomatoes to be sprayed, so they had to drop everything, cancel all their plans, and spray the tomatoes. And I love this analogy of the harvest because the harvest is the most important time of year for a farmer when they're collecting up the crops that they've worked so hard to grow. And during the harvest time, everybody would have to pitch in. Everybody would have to go above and beyond. Everybody would have to work long hours. Everybody would have to drop everything they were doing to bring in the harvest. And you can't wait. You can't delay. The harvest doesn't, uh, you know, work with your perfect little plans. The harvest happens, and when the harvest happens, you harvest. And I love, Jesus says, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. It's harvest time. The fields are ready. It's time to drop everything and go, to seize the opportunities in front of us. You know, we may have plans, we may have goals, we may think that we know what's important, but Jesus is telling us that it is time for the harvest. And when he provides opportunities between where we are and where we're going, we need to begin to have a harvest mentality. We need to begin to have the mindset, the mindset that when we see the opportunities, when we see that off ramp to make a difference in somebody's life, we're pulling off, we're whipping on that steering wheel, we're taking that time to invest in the people around us, even if it's inconvenient, even if it goes against our plans. When it's the harvest time, we harvest. When the crops are ready, we go out. We don't delay. We don't wait. We throw everything aside. And let me tell you, church, the time is now. 
It's harvest time in Kitchener Waterloo. It's harvest time in your workplace. It's harvest time in our schools. It's harvest time in your families. Let's go and let's begin to reap. Thanks so much for watching. If you were impacted by the message today, you can send us an email at mystory@slatechurch.com. And if you'd like to learn more, you can fill out one of our online connect cards. We would love to see you at one of our Sunday services and make sure to stay connected by following us on any of our social media, including Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram.